Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Miss Balahaja. Welcome to the story of World War II in Guam, Color and Learn Virtual Story Hour. I'm with a very special organization that is hosting this program called Pacific Historic Park. And we have a mission. We're here to keep alive the memory of historical events and to honor the people involved in them through education, interpretation, research, preservation, and restoration. I've brought with me today, Mrs. Nicole Calvo to help me do that. Papa days and buenas boys and girls. Today we have six elementary schools joining us. In our Zoom house, we have Mariso Elementary School, home of the dolphins, Astungo Elementary School, home of the butterflies, Atacao Elementary School, home of the Hilitai, Ordit Chalampago Elementary School, home of the ants, and PC Luhan Elementary School, home of the satellites. And last, but certainly not least, we have Talafoco Elementary School, home of the Tigers. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. This program is made possible by funding from Humanities Guahan, the National Endowment of the Humanities, and the Federal CARES Act. I hope everyone was able to receive a free copy of the story of World War II in Guam, Color and Learn book. And it is fitting that we are reading this today because we are celebrating Mess tomorrow. Mess tomorrow is also known as Guam History and Heritage Month, which is the time of year when our community celebrates and reflects on the island culture and its history. We have so much fun things planned for you this hour. Before we begin our reading, our story, I'm going to show a picture of a place on Guam. Everyone right now is on mute, meaning I can't hear you. So I want you to give me a virtual thumbs up. The thumbs up emoji is located on the reaction button on the toolbar on the bottom of your screen. So it will look like this. There you go. I see some of you already doing your thumbs up. Very good. It will look just like that. So if you've ever been to any of the places that Ms. Calvo and I are about to show you, please click your thumbs up. Let's begin the thumbs up game. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you have ever been to this place. It's called Assam Beach Park. Maybe some of you have flown kites there or gone running or biking with your parents or grandparents. But at this spot, 76 years ago, a battle between the Americans and Japanese took place right on these shores. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever been to this place. It's called Ga'an Point, and it is in the beautiful village of Agate. Very similar to Asen, there was a World War II battle here between the Japanese and American forces. Give me a thumbs up if you have ever driven past these in our island's capital of Agatnya. These are called the Hagatnya Tunnels. It was built during World War II through, a, through the forced labor of Chamorros, and it was used as a communication center and a shelter for Japanese commanders. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever visited this place. This is called the South Pacific Memorial Peace Park, and you can find it in the lovely village of Jigo. This is where the final battle of Guam took place. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever seen this memorial statue. You might have seen it if you ever join your family in a procession to the Menengan Memorial located in the village of Jotnya. Every year in July, people walk to this monument to remember and honor the Chamorro people who were forced to walk to a concentration camp located in the Menengan Valley. All of these places that we have just showed you have a connection. They are all related. What do you think all of these places have in common? I'm going to send everyone a question that will pop up on your screen right now so that all of you have a chance to guess the right answer. It is a multiple choice question. What do all of these places have in common? Take a minute to read the question and then choose the button that you think best answers the question. Just pick the one you think it is. Don't worry about getting it wrong because we're all here to learn. Should the answer be A, they're all old places and are falling apart? 
B, they're all, they are all historical places that can still be visited today that help us remember and understand something that happened in Guam's history. Could it be C, they are all places we cannot visit because they are locked up? Or D, they are all places to have fun, like swimming and hiking. Go ahead and choose your answer, and we'll wait to see when majority. Most of you did give the correct answer, which is letter B. And this is great. You're correct. Wonderful job. Yay. So I see, yeah. Okay. So. The part of history that these places have in common is that they are all part of World War II. World War II was a very difficult time for the people living on Guam because there was a war going on and people were hungry. They were hurt and scared and some lost their lives. These are places today here in Guam that we can visit. We can remember and honor the bravery and sacrifices of those people who were affected by the war. It also helps us to learn more and understand the courage and strength of those who lived and died in the war. Boys and girls, we're going to learn more about World War II today. And to help us do that, I've invited some friends to join us. I would like you, I would like to introduce you to one of our guests. Her name is Ms. Dominica Tolentino, and she is an historian of Guam. She's going to share a little bit more about World War II. Now, if you have any questions for Ms. Tolentino, please type your questions in the chat box and she'll answer them later in the hour. Welcome, Ms. Tolentino. Thank you, Ms. Nicole and Ms. Jackie, for inviting me to join you today. And thank you to all you students and teachers for being here as well. Today, you're learning about E. Tiempunguera, the time of war. This is the time that the Chamorro people actually experienced for themselves World War II and what we call the Japanese occupation when Guam was taken over and ruled by the Japanese military. Now, this happened in 1941, that's 80 years ago. But let me start by just explaining a little bit about what was happening here in Guam at the time. You'll see a map of the United States, I mean, I'm sorry, of the Pacific, and you can see Guam, the United States, because Guam was a territory of the U.S., just like it still is today. Back then, most people lived in small houses located in two main villages, Hagatnya and Sumai. Sumai was a village in southern Guam, where naval base Guam is now located. Life was peaceful, but at the end of 1941, everything changed. Now, World War II actually started a little bit earlier in Europe. The major countries that fought were divided into two sides, the Axis powers and the Allies. Now, it's complicated why the war started, but basically some countries wanted to make themselves bigger and more powerful so they could dominate the other countries in the world. Germany wanted to extend its borders throughout Europe. So in 1939, the Germans invaded the neighboring country of Poland, and this officially began World War II. Over here in the Pacific, Japan wanted to increase its territory too, and take control over the Pacific Islands and the rest of Asia. Japan already had territories throughout Micronesia, but Guam was a territory of the United States, and so was Hawaii and another island called Wake Island. Japan would have to attack these places if they wanted to control the entire Pacific. So on December 7th, 1941, Japan attacked the naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. They caused a lot of damage to US airplanes and battleships, including the USS Arizona, the ship on the left of this slide. This ship still lies at the bottom of the harbor. A few hours later, which would be December 8th here in Guam, the Japanese bombed Sumai. Sumai was an important target because that was where the military barracks and the cable station were located. Hagatnya was where the naval governor had his office. That morning, there were many people at the cathedral attending mass. When the bombing started, everyone ran home, packed what they could, and headed to their ranches or anywhere they could find shelter. On December 10th, the Japanese forces finally invaded the island. They made their way to Hagatnya and killed a group of Chamorros who had actually tried to escape. When they got to the Plaza de España, they were met with gunfire from the Guam Insular Guard. Unfortunately, the guardsmen were overpowered by the Japanese, and the governor of Guam had to surrender. He had to give up the island. Now in power, the Japanese really made life hard for the Chamorros and forced them to obey all kinds of rules. One rule was that all Chamorros had to get a pass in order to move around the island. They also had to bow down respectfully in front of the Japanese soldiers because if they didn't, 
they would be punished. Regular school was stopped for many children and the Japanese opened new schools where their language and traditions were taught. You weren't allowed to speak Chamorro or English in these schools. Even harder, the men, women, and children were forced to work for the Japanese to grow food for the soldiers and to build roads, airstrips, and pillboxes. For 32 months, that's like two and a half years, the Chamorros lived under Japanese rule. It was a scary time. This was war and people were afraid. Meanwhile, the rest of the war was happening outside Guam. The fighting here became known as the Pacific War and the Americans were fighting the Japanese going from one island to the next. In June, 1944, they finally reached Saipan. The battle in Saipan was brutal and many people were killed. The Japanese knew Guam was next, so they forced all the Chamorros to move to concentration camps. Thousands of Chamorros walked for miles with what few belongings and food they had to make it to the camps. The Americans bombed Guam for two weeks to weaken the Japanese defenses. There were so many bombs that were dropped that many buildings were destroyed. Some people claim, though, that being in the concentration camps may have actually saved Chamorro lives. Unfortunately, for dozens of Chamorros, this was the deadliest time because the Japanese soldiers became desperate and began to massacre Chamorros in Maritzo, Hagatnya, and Jigo. In Atati, near Maritzo, a group of men from the village actually attacked a group of Japanese soldiers and took away their weapons. And they were Guam's first liberators. The next day, on July 21st, 1944, the Americans finally landed in Guam, but it took another two weeks of heavy fighting for the Americans to finally secure the island. The Chamorros were relieved to see the American soldiers. They knew the end of the occupation had arrived, but remember, this was not the end of the war. The dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan the following summer in 1945 finally led to the end of World War II. So I'll stop right here and uh, thank you for your attention and we'll turn this over now to Miss Jackie. Thank you, Miss Tolentino. That was a wonderful overview of the war that you shared with us. Boys and girls, we're going to be saving your questions for Miss Tolentino until after we've read the book. So please keep sending us your questions in the chat box if you have any. Okay, so it is now time for us to read the story of World War II in Guam Color and Learn book. To help us do this, I would like to introduce you to another very special speaker. Her name is Mrs. Natividad Calvo, better known as Auntie Natty. And she was a little girl when the war happened on Guam. Welcome, Auntie Natty. Boys and girls, please take out your books now. Uh, if you don't have one, you may read along uh, on, on the screen. The Story of World War II in Guam, Color and Learn by Pacific Historic Parks. Pacific Historic Parks is proud to offer a Color and Learn book highlighting the experience of the people of Guam during World War II. As the leading organization supporting significant historical sites in the Pacific for future generations, we work hard to perpetuate the memory of events and honor the people involved in the Pacific historic locations through education, interpretation, research, preservation, and restoration. While this coloring book is, a, is brief and offers a glimpse of the many stories of the people of Guam, we hope this serves as an invitation to learn more and understand the sacrifices and strength of those who lived through the war. For more information about World War II in the Pacific, stop by the Pacific Historic Parks Museum Store located at the T. Stell Newman Visitor Center or visit our website. Guam is a beautiful island in the Pacific and home to the Chamorro people. In 1940, about 22,000 people lived here. Most resided in the villages of Agatnya, the capital, and Sumay. Families farmed and grew food like coconut, breadfruit, and taro. They also had animals such as carabao, chickens, and fish. Chamorros also were excellent fishermen. They would catch many kinds of fish to eat, such as parrotfish or palaxi, unicornfish or tataga, and young rabbitfish or manyaha. 
On the morning of December 8, 1941, a group of Japanese planes came flying from the east, shooting bullets from the sky above the island. Bombs destroyed villages in the villages of Sumai and Piri. Tutamores were killed and several injured. December 8th was a holy day in the Catholic Church. Many families were attending mass when the first planes attacked Sumai. In fear for their lives, families gathered quickly to flee to their homes and lunches or ranches. In the early morning hours of December 10th, about 3,000 Japanese soldiers landed on the shores of Guam. There were only a handful of American and Chamorro military personnel to defend the island. A group of Chamorro men from the Guam Insular Force Guard tried their best to protect the island and its people at the Plaza de España in Hagatnya. Insular Force Guardsman Pedro Cruz was one of the platoon leaders who fought bravely using a machine gun to stop the invaders. Despite their valiant efforts, Mr. Cruz and his fellow guard members could not stop them. The governor of Guam was forced to surrender the island. Guam was renamed Omiyajima, or the Great Shrine Island. Young students now had to learn the Japanese language and culture in school. Chamorro families were forced to register with the new Japanese government and carry passes wherever they traveled around the island. The new Japanese government forced the people of Guam to work for them. Everyone was required to work, men, women, and children. They had to build airstrips and pillboxes. Some had to install guns at several coastal areas and transport food and bullets. Others were ordered to plant and harvest crops to feed the new Japanese forces on the island. The people of Guam worked without pay and were punished if they resisted. At the same time, some Americans living on Guam were captured and taken to Japan and put in prisoner of war camps. Mrs. Agata Iglesias Johnston was a respected educator and community leader. Her husband, William, an American, was sent away to Japan. Mrs. Johnston retrieved information from people who listened to hidden radios and secretly shared news with other Chamorros so they would know how the rest of the world was doing. News of the war gave them hope that the Americans would one day return to Guam. Jesus Baza Duenas was a Catholic priest who helped people living in Southern Guam during the war. After the invasion, some American soldiers hid in the jungle rather than surrender. With the help of Chamorro families, one remained hidden from Japanese troops. Father Duenas, known for speaking out against the Japanese, was killed for refusing to reveal where the soldier was hiding. The Chamorros never lost hope. They would say to one another during those dark days, Tiu upman, na i animo, or it will soon be over, have faith. In July 1944, the Japanese command ordered the relocation of people from their homes to concentration camps. The largest camp was the Menengun camp near the village of Jonia. Thousands of people were marched across the island with no time to prepare. When they got to the camp, there was little shelter, food, and clean water. Many died of illness or starvation. On July 21, 1944, American military forces returned to Guam. Of the reefs, American battleships and landing crafts, along with over 50,000 U.S. troops, arrived on the village shores of Essen and Agate. The battle for Guam lasted three weeks. On August 10, 1944, the Americans announced they successfully secured the island. In the end, over 1,700 American soldiers and 17,500 Japanese defenders lost their lives. During and after the battle for Guam, 
Many Chamos who had been hiding in the jungles or living in the camps were relieved to see the American soldiers. The American soldiers kindly offered the men, women, and children items such as candy, crackers, candy, and toys. These small gestures by the soldiers helped lift the spirits of the Chamos who had suffered and lost so much during the war. After American forces took over Guam, several Japanese soldiers, including Sergeant Shoichi Yokoi, ran to the jungles to escape capture. For the next 28 years, Yokoi hid in caves and survived by fishing and trapping food. He made clothes out of burlap sacks and hibiscus fibers. He bathed in the Taokoko River to prevent illness. He was eventually caught by two Chamorro men, Manuel de Gracia and Jesus Duenas. They treated Yokoi with kindness and fed him before turning him in. Yokoi re returned to Japan in 1972 and came back to visit Guam several times with his wife until he died in 1997. The number of Chamorros impacted by the war is not exactly known. However, it is believed that over 1,000 lives were lost. Today, there are memorials around the island with the names of people of Guam who died and suffered. In 2020, the American government made payments to Guam survivors. The government recognized their losses and their loyalty to the United States during wartime. These payments were called war reparations. It was long awaited by those who persevered through the Japanese occupation and the Battle of Guam. World War II left a huge mark on the land, the people, and the history of the island. Every year on July 21st, Guam celebrates Liberation Day, usually with a parade and a carnival. The first liberation celebration was in 1945 and was organized by Mrs. Agata Johnston. Most importantly, we commemorate and remember those affected by the war. We reflect on the courage and sacrifice of those who fought for Guam, those who lost their lives, and survivors of this tragic period in history. In remembrance of all who sacrificed for liberty, may peace and understanding prevail so that no future generation will ever be compelled to repeat these sacrifices. Today, let us honor their legacy by understanding the ways of others, working in harmony, building friendships, and promoting a more peaceful world. The end. Great. Thank you. Auntie Natty was born and raised on Guam when she was a little girl. World War II happened and her life became very different. We are so humbled to have Auntie Natty here with us today because she lived through it and understands more than anyone the legacies of the war and the importance of peace and understanding in our world. Boys and girls, if you have any questions for Auntie Natty, please remember to type them in the chat box. Auntie Natty, would you like to share with us some of your experiences of the war? Oh yes, thank you, Jackie. Boys and girls, I was only two years old when the Japanese invaded Guam. And when the Americans liberated Guam, I was four years old. It was right after the invasion of Guam that when I was in Chalampawu, where I stayed after we were told to move from Agatnya to go back to our farmland because of the Japanese, I was walking one morning there with my mother and we saw many trucks carrying military men, soldiers. And then after several Car, trucks that passed us, one of the trucks stopped. And about two, three soldiers were walking toward my mother and I. 
one of the soldiers came. He was holding something. And he was giving me that something. I whacked out, which I had never had before, especially during the war. When I saw that rag, rag doll, was so, it was so beautiful, but I was really scared of the man because of the walk that we had been walking from Chalampago to the concentration camp in Maningun. So I feared any other uh, people than, than Chomos. So I, don't, I, I really didn't know who it was. The man even knelt down I was offering me for the rat doll to take from his hand. My mother was looking because I hid behind my mother's mestiza. And my mother said, Nathy, hago, my daughter Nathy. Munga maanyo, seni nane o ni marikano i muneka. Don't be afraid, my daughter. The soldier's giving you a doll. So I look up at my mother, and my mother nodded her head. So I look at the man kneeling down to my heart. I was giving me the rag doll. I took that rag doll right away and I held it and then I ran away. I didn't even say thank you to the soldier because I was so, so, so very happy, young boys and girls, when I was four years old, to have my first toy ever in my hand. And it's right after the war by uh, one of the men, the soldiers who liberated Guam. That was very touching on my part, on boys and girls, and your teacher, if you're interested in finding out more about this ragdoll, we have a book being sold and you can ask Jackie about it and Nicole, and they'll show you, they'll keep in touch with you to give you the address of where that uh, rag dogs being sold. The name of this book is The Rag Dog and a memoir, The Rag Dog and the Soldier, the Marine. Boys and girls, thank you very much and I hope you have that peace and love with you always. Thank you, Miss Jackie. Thank you, Auntie Natty, for sharing your story. At this time, I'd like to bring back Ms. Tolentino to join us for the question and answer session. I would also like to introduce Ms. Giovanna Lynn Muffness, who's also with Pacific Historic Parks, and she's in our sister island of Saipan right now. Ms. Muffness has been very quietly saving all of your questions that you typed for us, and she's now going to read them out loud. Ms. Giovanna Lynn? Good morning, everyone. I already see that we have a few questions and more questions coming in. The first question comes from John for Auntie Natty. Did your family farm and grow food? If they did, what did they have? Oh yes, my families did farm. They grew string beans, of course, pepper, hot pepper that is. They even planted cherries. The fire grew wild on the islands and was all over our uh, place in Chalampago. These are some of the uh, vegetables. And I just remember even small tomatoes. Thank you, Auntie Natty. We have another question for, for you from Carolyn. Did your parents or siblings have to work? Did your parents or siblings have to work for the Japanese? Did my parents work for the Japanese? Not that I remember, or my parents telling me about it, but I do remember my brothers and sisters. They were around maybe 10, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. They were the ones that left our place and worked for the Japanese soldiers. And we have another question for you from Dosarlene. How did you survive World War II on Guam? How did you survive World War II in Guam? How did you survive? How did I survive? My Lord, my God. I survived 
with my parents taking care of me, walking with me, warning me of what to do. Whenever I hear a prank, they told me, Nati Agal, Tada Unuri Batkelaili Yairi. Every time that you hear a plane from the sky, run as fast as you can. Falaguna And they told me to run as fast as I can with anyone that's calling me, like my, one of my brothers. Hurry up, my sister. Hurry up. Make yourself faster. And then he'll grab my hand and then we'll go down to the valley because our, our house, our ranch was up on the, uh, a little hill. And we slid down, holding ourselves in one of the rope. And by the time I came down to the cave with, that my parents had uh, built and my brothers, I was giggling because I thought we were playing games. I didn't realize the seriousness of the war, you know, being just three, four years old. So then one of my sisters was, and everybody looked so scared. And that's when I just started receding back and became very quiet. Thank you, Auntie Nadi. Dosarlene also has a question for Ms. Tolentino. Why were people forced to learn Japanese? I'm sorry, can you say that? Why were people forced to learn Japanese? Yes. Um, the, uh, remember that at this time, Guam was an American territory. So people, even though they weren't American citizens, they knew a lot about American culture. They spoke English, they watched American movies and listened to American music. They, they celebrated American holidays. So the Americans really, Guam was really like an American place. So when the Japanese came to Guam, like they did with their other colonies in the Pacific, they had to make them more like Japanese people. So the first thing you do is you teach them the language. That way you can communicate with the, uh, with the people, the natives of, of the island. So really that was why you had those schools set up so that the Chamorro people in Guam could become familiar with Japanese language and Japanese customs. Now Saipan to the north was already a Japanese territory. So they already knew some Japanese language and Japanese customs. They already had a lot of Japanese people living there. Guam had a small Japanese population here. There's lots of families that have Japanese last names still today. But um, to really get the natives to become loyal to Japan, you have to teach them how to be loyal Japanese citizens. So that was why they had those schools set up. Thank you, Ms. Tolentino. Our next question is for Antinari. Justice has a question for you. How did you feel during the war? I was very, very scared. What do you expect? That we're all ending the war four years later. I was really scared. There was a time when, uh, because when the the, the Marine had given me the rag doll, and then my mother took it away because it was very, very dirty. That was the time when I just completely forgot about everything. What that Marina told, taught me was that there's loving people in this world, despite the atrocities of the Japanese soldiers, especially during our march to Maningun. The rag doll that that soldier had given me gave me peace and love. That even soldiers who went to war will remember a young child to give a very cuddly, little, beautiful thing that I always, even before I sleep, I always have that pretty doll. And it took me about 56 years later to find out and meet the man that had given me the soldier marine, the rag doll. My young boys and girls, imagine yourself now going to be in war. The pandemic's nothing as compared to what I experienced. So I even forgot some of the things that had happened that when I really recall one area, I was totally taking it back until the 60th anniversary of Guam's liberation when I was walking 
to the constant purity of God in my neighborhood. When I saw a view that I never recall what it was, because every time I passed since my teenage life, the younger days to my teenager, teenage life, I always come across this scene and that I became afraid, lonely. Just receiving that, I just didn't know until 56 years later when I came across the man and then my mother telling me with all the manamkos that really experienced, they were older, they were parents at the time with children. My daughter Nati here received a rag doll from one of the soldiers, young boys and girls, anything that had been given you, especially in wartime, accept it and understand the lovingness and peacefulness of those people are giving you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Auntie Nadi. Our next question is from Jumarbin, and this is for Ms. Tolentino. Why did the Japanese people hate Guam? I'm sorry, your, your connection, uh, my connection broke you up, but say that again, please. I'm sorry. The question is from Jumarbin. Why did the okay. Japanese people hate Guam? Why did they hate Guam? Yes. I wouldn't say that they, I wouldn't say that they hated Guam, um, but you know, this was a time of war. So, so the Japanese people had to do what they're ordered to do, which is to fight the Americans. And because Guam was an American territory, the Chamorros were already kind of loyal to the United States. So when the Japanese came to Guam, Guam is already seen as an enemy. And so they had to treat them like an enemy. And sometimes because war is cruel, um, people do very mean things to each other. Um, They've had to make sure that the Chamorros on Guam would obey them. Um, and so that's where some of that cruelty comes from. Um, but I don't think it was necessarily because they were Chamorro that they hated them, but it was more about being a time of war and they were loyal to the United States, which at that time was the enemy. So that's led to that cruelty. Thank you. Carolyn has a question for you as well. At this okay. time, who was the governor of Guam? The governor at the time of the Japanese invasion was um, a Navy captain named George McMillan. He was actually the governor for about a year and a half. He came to Guam in 1940 with his family. Um, but in November, just like all the other military families, they got sent back to the States. And so George McMillan was one of a few um, Navy men and Marines that were still on Guam when the invasion happened in, on December 10th. Um, so yes, that was his name, George McMillan. He was a captain in the U.S. Navy. Thank you, Ms. Tolentino. Sure. I have a question for Auntie Natty. What happened when you went to the camps? Were you in the camps when you were little? Oh my gosh, I remember walking and I saw so many people. Most of them are just pooing all over the area. And I was scared because I don't even remember whether I was wearing shoes, slippers or whatever. I think I was without any shoe. And I looked and said, oh, it's like I'm gonna vomit and everything. And as a matter of fact, just to let all of you know, my younger brother is probably one year uh, apart from me, passed away right after the liberation with dysentery. Many Chamos died because of that. The, the, the water from the river was dirty. People vomiting, having diarrhea, cleaning up and everything. So that was what I remembered. And then they all have like, it's not a thatch roof, just from the sword grass. And they cover it. Like, I don't know what, what they use on the top to hold, like a teepee, like an Indian camp and something. And that was what we had. And then of course, our flooring, because it's wet when we're coming in, we have to, they, had, they cover it again with the reeds that you see whenever you travel. 
to uh, uh, the southern part of the island growing in the mountain area, salt grass, we call it. Thank you, Auntie Nari. I have another question for you from Carolyn. She's wondering, do you still have the ragdoll? Oh yes, definitely. It's a new one though, after I had met the soldier, because I told you my mother took the ragdoll away from me because it was very, very dirty. And I didn't know at the time, because if I knew that I can wash that ragdoll, like what I used to do now, uh, I would have washed it myself, but I didn't know. I it was super dirty that my mother didn't just burn it or something. That ragdoll, the second ragdoll that I, I got after meeting the man, the liberator in October 1st, uh, 2001, right after 911, Natty's travel flew with a plane back to the state and that ragdoll the man had given me the second time around. It's beautiful. I wish I had it with me and show you. Thank you, Auntie Nari. I have a question for Ms. Tolentino. Ms. Tolentino, it says that Mrs. Agata Johnson secretly shared news. How was the news shared without the Japanese knowing? Uh, well, as, as you see in the coloring book, she used, um, she would get information from people that had radios that they hid from the Japanese because at, at that time they, they weren't allowed to have those radios. But one of her tricks was to write messages of things that she heard. She would put them on the, wrap them, those messages around those bars of soap and those got distributed to different families. And then as, as they would talk, they, they would talk about, um, about important things like the war going on and stuff. But to keep it secret, the big advantage they had was that they spoke Chamorro um, because the Japanese didn't understand Chamorro. So they could, so the Chamorro people could actually communicate with each other directly just by speaking in their language. But um, they still had to be careful though about that because um, there were some people that were interpreters that were brought in from Saipan to act as interpreters um, and they were tasked with, with translations and stuff. But amongst themselves, amongst the Guamanian Chamorros, they were able to communicate a lot by just using their own native language that the Japanese didn't understand. Thank you, Ms. Tolentino. We have uh, time for one last question for Auntie Nari. Auntie Nari, how many siblings do you have? I also see that we have a lot of requests if they can see your ragdoll. I have altogether six children. Your, your children, your, your brothers and sisters. My brothers and sisters, there were 14 altogether, but remaining now, just my older brother, who was, uh, who is about four years older than I am. And then myself and my younger sister, who was born the day before Guam's liberation. So it's going to be 75 years this year on Guam's liberation or 77, I'm not too sure. My sister was born the day before Guam's liberation, July 20, 1944. She's living back in the States. And then, of course, my youngest brother, baby brother, she's still living. Thank you, Auntie Nadi. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. They were wonderful. I'm going to turn it over to Miss Jackie. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. We're finishing up our hour here together. Um, Auntie Nadi talked a lot about uh, the rag doll and her experience. This is the book. I will be preparing uh, some information on this and sending it to your teachers. If you want to know what happened to Auntie Nadi, uh, and the ragdoll and the soldier who gave it to her, it is all here in this book right here. So, uh, which we sell at the Pacific Historic Parks Bookstore at the Peace Cell Newman Visitor Center. So I'll send that to the teachers. Before we go, I wanted to thank you all. It's so special that we can be together in this virtual space. Can you believe that you attended school with kids from other schools? If you are a fourth grader, from a Stumbo or Atacal Elementary School, you shared the same learning space with a fourth grader from PC Lujan and Talafosu Elementary School. So how cool is that? 
We want to give a special thanks to Auntie Natty for sharing her experience of the war and reading along with us for Miss Tolentino for giving us background about World War II and our special friends behind the computers, my coworkers, making this program run smoothly. Miss Mugnus and our sister island of, of Saipan and Mr. Saito and our another sister island of Hawaii. We also want to give you a special thanks to your school principals and teachers for supporting this program from the beginning. We've been working together since last year to make this program happen. Without their letters of support, we would not have been able to get the grant to produce this book and program. Lastly, boys and girls, as we celebrate MESH tomorrow, we remember our past and we celebrate our heritage. I hope you enjoyed this program and are inspired to learn about your family stories in World War II in Guam or in other places in the Pacific that was affected by the war. Biba Mesh tomorrow, Biba Guam. Adios, boys and girls. Until next time. Thank you. Bye. Adios. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.